And now, live from Jerusalem, you're listening to Israel Inspired Radio. Here are your hosts, Rabbis Ari Abramowitz and Jeremy Gimpel. So my name is Jeremy Gimpel. I haven't left Israel now in more than three years. And this is the first audience that I'm addressing now where it used to be four or five times a year I would lecture around the world. I've been in every continent speaking to Jewish communities around the world. But for the last three years, I've been building and developing the deepest settlement in Judea today. It's a diamond in the crown of the mountains of Judea. It was a barren desert and it's now turning into a Garden of Eden-like oasis. That's the second most popular tourist attraction in Eastern Gush Etzion, after the Herodian Herod's Summer Palace. And um, I just want to tell you the story of how I got there, why I'm there, and what I'm doing there. And I think throughout the story, um, so much is to be learned for our people today. Speak nice and loud, Terry. Nice and loud. So my grandfather walked from Russia to Israel in 1916 when he was 15 years old. It took him a year and a half. I today have a 15 year old. If I can get the phone out of that boy's hands for like two minutes, I feel like a hero. My grandfather walked from Bialystok to Israel for a year and a half to establish what would be the new Jewish homeland or the new Jewish state. And he arrived in Israel in 1916 he spent the first two years of his life planting eucalyptus trees all around the Kinneret. He joined Kibbutz Deganya at that time, which is the first kibbutz in Israel. And he, he came from an Orthodox Jewish home, but walking at the age of 15 for a year and a half, it was hard to keep kosher. So he kind of became a little bit more just traditional. But Kibbutz Deganya at that time was ideologically secular. He remembers they used to have pork barbecues on Yom Kippur on the Sea of Galilee as like a celebration in their rebellion against God. And so after two years, you know, he just needed a place to, to eat and someone to take care of him, a place to sleep. Um, so after two years, he moved to Jerusalem. But today you go around the Sea of Galilee and there are these beautiful 100-year-old eucalyptus trees. And so me and my children take great pride in the fact that my grandfather had a hand on a lot of those trees. You know, before the Jews came back to Israel, the northern part of Israel were swamps. The southern part of Israel was a desert. No one could live anywhere. People were dying of malaria. It was just, you know, a barren wasteland. And, you know, I just, I was in Ben Gurion International Airport just a, just a day and a half ago. And I've been in London, Sydney, Melbourne, LA, New York. Ben Gurion is the nicest airport by far in the whole world. Where we were just about 100 years ago, and where we are today in the modern state of Israel is just marvelous. It's a mystery. It's miraculous. But um, I always grew up with the legends of my grandfather because my father was born in Jerusalem. His mother wanted him to become a doctor. My mother wanted me to become a lawyer. In my family, are either a doctor, a lawyer, or a failure. That's the way it works. <laughs> and I, you know, I told my parents, I was like, but Abba, I'm in the middle of law school. I really, I want to be a rabbi. And they're like, a rabbi? What kind of job is that for a good Jewish boy? <laughs> and so um, he wanted to become a doctor. And there was only one medical school in Israel at the time. So he came to the United States uh, to eventually become a doctor. After just a wild story of divine providence and just a Jewish story of unbelievable magnitude, somehow he ended up at Emory University. And eventually I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia until I was about 11. And then at 11, my whole family moved back to Israel in the middle of the Gulf War. And um, I always grew up with the legends of my grandfather in Atlanta, that I had a grandfather that walked for a year and a half, and I was so jealous of that generation and the generation after him, where the Etzel and the Lehi fighters were fighting off the British to establish the independence. And I kind of grew up being like, what is the mission of this generation? What, who are the Etzel fighters today? Who are the heroes of Israel today? Who are they? What is uh, high tech? Is it the innovators in Herzliya? Like, that's Zionism today? Like, what is the mission now? And that's kind of was hovering over my life for years. And then four years ago, I was sent by the mayor of Gush Etzion. Um, he said, the most important and strategic farm is being established in the weakest part in Judea today. And this farm is connecting four sparse, barely existing Jewish communities 
deep into what the world calls the West Bank. And right now, Bedouin squatters are just pitching tents and planting trees funded by European governments. And as soon as they plant a tree and pitch a tent, in the legal realities of Israel today, it is virtually impossible to remove them. And it says, if they were not there, then the Jewish block that was being established would be broken up. And this is like a linchpin for Jewish settlement today. And I'm like, well, you know, okay, I'll see what I, I mean, help Israeli farmers. I didn't, I didn't know what to do with that information, although I'm constantly active in trying to help Israel and promote Israel. Um, so for months, I'm just kind of like in the back of my mind, okay, there's this farm. All of a sudden, I come across a Christian organization that brings volunteer farmers to Samaria to help farmers in Samaria. And I said, well, that's just brilliant. Judea and Samaria, it's kind of a package deal. They're not exactly there, but I'm going to introduce the head of that organization to these two Israeli farmers. And so I got the head of this organization. I brought them out to this farm. And no, like this place, the Aru Goat Farm, is 10 minutes outside of Ephrat. Do you guys know where Ephrat is? That's like Rabbi Riskin's, you know, it's like one of the largest settlements in Israel today. And I, I went to high school in Ephrat. I had never been that deep into Judea before. It, even though it was right 10 minutes outside, just kind of east towards the Dead Sea. And I arrived there and I say, you know, hello, Mr. Organization. Hello, Israeli farmers. Nice to meet you. Hi, Mr. Farmer. Okay, come to, good luck. Okay, my mitzvah for the day, check. <laughs> and then I turned around and I, I saw the views of Judea, the unadulterated views. No, it's like it was the frontier. As far, I, I had a video that I just, I wanted to show you. As far as your eyes can see, there's nothing there. Just mountains and mountains and deserts until you see the Dead Sea and then the mountains of Jordan, just the open mountains of Judea and the Judean desert. And I don't know how to explain this, but I mean, I saw this Jew Yossi planting trees in the <laughs> desert. And it, I felt like, what? You can, you can be a pioneer in 2019. You can, you can, you, I like, I could continue the work of my grandfather now. This is unbelievable. And I don't know. It's like my soul just was connected to this land. I don't know. I don't, I just, it's, I wish that I could articulate it in a, in a better, it was, I was called to the land, like lech lecha. This is meant for you, Jeremy. And so Friday passed and the, nothing ever happened with that organization because the Shomron in Judea, it's really like a, an hour and a half drive and it just wasn't practical. But then Sunday I came back to this place and Monday I came back and Tuesday. And at that time I was going through a little bit of a religious crisis. And as a rabbi, that's a big deal. But I, I just, I couldn't, yeah, I just, a davening in Shul, in Neve Daniel, which is where I was from, I became a little bit in rote. I found it a little bit meaningless and boring for me. It looked like everyone was saying watermelon. Just like opening up a book and going, watermelon, 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 watermelon. And I'm like, I just, I don't want to, I just, I need a break from Shul for a while. And I just discovered one of the most beautiful places I'd ever seen in Israel. And it's just a 15 minute drive. So I would go in the morning to these mountains, pray my morning prayers, and then go to work in Jerusalem. Come and pray my morning, and then go to Jerusalem. And I just was so in love with this place. And you have to understand like the geopolitical importance of this place. There's a story of Ariel Sharon and George W. Bush. They're in a helicopter. And Ariel Sharon says, without Judea and Samaria, there are times when Israel is nine miles wide. And George Bush says, nine miles wide, their driveway is longer than that in Texas. <laughs> How can you defend a country that's nine miles wide? It's indefensible. And so here we are now literally strengthening Israel in such a weak area. So I was driven at the beginning by some sort of geopolitical Zionist agenda. I wanted to defend the land of Israel and put an end to the two-state solution and fight for our rights and our land. But then when I got there, the politics seemed almost irrelevant. It was like a deep soul connection to these mountains. And so it was, you know, at the end it was like, oh my gosh, to, to make another Gaza terror state in Judea and Samaria where just, I mean, it's, it's national suicide. But then once I was there, it was a love affair. And I just kept on coming back to these mountains. And then eventually Yossi came up to me and says, Jeremy, you're the only one that comes out here. Everyone else thinks we're crazy. And I'm like, well, I don't, I've just, this is the most beautiful, you're planting trees. In the, I mean, this is the most inspiring thing I've ever seen. I love it here. I just keep on coming back. I don't know what to say. 
And he said, well, if you love it here so much, we need to bring the water line out to these mountains or the trees are all going to die. And I was like, Yossi, you, you planted trees in the desert with, without any water? That's crazy. Who would do that? He's like, well, we, we had to plant the trees. This is Rocky Bay Munab, but only with faith. We just got to do what we had to do. And he used to come every day with a land cruiser in a big tank of water and by hand water the trees that he had just planted. And he's like, listen, I got a job. I can't do this. We need to bring a water line out here. And I'm like, okay, a water line. Well, how, uh, how much would that cost to bring the water line out? And he says, well, Ma'ale Amos is the closest Jewish community that has a state water line and a water tower. To bring the piping and infrastructure and digging, it'll be 110,000 shekels. And you know, my wife is a lawyer. I went to law school, but I became a rabbi instead. Um, <laughs> but you know, every week or every month, my wife and I would put a little bit of money aside to buy a seven-seater for our fifth kid. And in our savings account, we had almost exactly 110,000 shekels. So I brought Tehillah out to the mountain. And we said, you know, we could bring the water infrastructure to a mountain in the land of Israel, in the most strategic area that Israel needs right now. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Let's mortgage our tithes. We'll mortgage our maaser. We give 10% of our money to tzedakah anyway. We'll give them all of our money now and then we won't give tzedakah for like eight years. <laughs> and we'll just jump on the opportunity. And my wife is the coolest lady on the planet and she's like, all right, let's do it. So I went out to the bank and I'm like, excuse me, could I like to have 110,000 shekels cash? And the banker was like, what? In Israel, that's actually illegal now. You're not allowed to pull out so much cash anymore. They've limited it to 10,000 shekels. But at the time there was no law and she's putting stacks and stacks of cash on the counter. And I'm like putting it slowly into my bag. Like I feel like I'm in the mafia and I'm walking around now with a bag full of just like, I'd never had so much money in my life. And in Israel, I walk around with a gun, or like I have my gun in my bag and I'm like walking like carefully, slowly to the car. And I walk over to us and I hand him a big bag of cash saying, all right, let's bring the water line out. And that was the beginning of my relationship with this place. It was just like a love offering from my heart to be, to not feel like I'm just visiting this place, but wow, I actually contributed in building it. Wow, that is so exhilarating and amazing for me. And so then like for years, I was kind of struggling with what to do with this place. Because I mean, I had a job in Jerusalem. I had an amazing life in Neve Daniel. Do you guys know where Neve Daniel is? It's like across the street from Ephrat. A beautiful community, 15 minutes outside of Jerusalem. My brother was my next door neighbor. His wife and my wife are best friends. All of our children were best friends. My kids came home. There were systems in place to move to a mountain alone with any with no infrastructure and the most contested real estate in the world. Okay, I can go and support this project. I don't think I'm gonna move there, but I felt like, gosh, but what if, you know? So for years, I was trying to bring donors there and bring groups there and make people aware that this, there is this farm that's being constructed. And we're kind of going along and slowly but surely. And Eventually, we had to make a decision. And sometimes, you know, you're, you're, I don't know why, how do we make decisions? Eventually, it's got to come from like your insides, but there's so many reasons that, you know, it's like the pros and cons. And the pros and cons never lined up. I mean, I, I'm going to sell my house and then build a house that was like in this, what if it gets destroyed? It was in the middle of the Obama administration. What if there is a two-state solution? What if we get just, oh, I will just lose everything? I mean, what about the security of this place? What will my kids do? What will happen to my marriage? Will it rip my marriage apart? I mean, there was just uh, it was too many reasons not to. Well, it was two years ago, almost to the day, the eve before Rosh Hashanah. And I went to this evening preparing for the holiday. I'm like, if I'm already going to spend two days in synagogue, I want to go and I want it to make it meaningful. So I went to this preparation with the rabbi that I learned with. And his preparations, they're not with like source sheets, it's with a musical band. And there's music and Torah and meditation. And it's just a beautiful night that I feel like it's something almost that only happens in Israel. It's like a Torah of the land. And in the middle of the night, he says that Rosh Hashanah is celebrating the creation of the world. And this is the night before Rosh Hashanah. In the calendar, these are the moments before the creation. And it's as if God was in the time of dreaming of creation before that let there be light big bang moment. What was there before that? It was just the dreams and thoughts of God. And now this is your time to think and to dream for what you want for your new year. 
This is the most opportune time of the year. And I'm like, okay, my father is a neurologist and a psychiatrist in Israel. He's one of Israel's experts on ADHD. The reason why he became one of Israel's experts is because he had to raise me. <laughs> and so to dream up on command is not something that I can just do because as soon as I start dreaming, five other things pop in my head about things that I need to do and things that I want to do. But the rabbi sort of giving us guidance. He's like, well, where are you? Who's with you? Put some color to it. And all of a sudden, I'm sort of making a mental image in my mind. And I start dreaming about the farm. And like, we have a house on a mountain. And our children are running through the fields barefoot. And people from all over the world are coming to work the land and volunteer and learn the Torah. It's a beautiful dream. So we go home. We're both, my wife and I are lying in bed. And she's like, Jeremy, what did you dream about? And I said, oh, Tila, it was beautiful. We had a a house on the mountain and our kids were running through the fields and people were coming from around the world to volunteer and learn the Torah. My wife jumps out of bed in a startled state. I'm like, what is going on? She runs into the baby room, which is like a door right off of our bedroom, which was like a half room where the baby sleeps and they're still little. The baby wakes up. I hear books fumbling off the shelves. She pulls out a notebook and throws it on the bed and she says, read this. And I open it up and I'm reading, it's her diary from when she was 18. Now I only met Tahila when she was 19. And I'm reading, it's my 18th birthday and I just had the most powerful dream. When I told her what I dreamt of, she had like this deja vu moment. And she's like, I know that dream. And I'm starting to read her diary entry. I'm married with children and I'm living on a mountain in some type of farm. People from all over the world are coming to volunteer and work the land. And we're teaching them how beautiful the Torah is. And I'm like, what is going on here? This is creepy. What is this? And then the last two sentences, I don't know how I'm going to get there. I'm going to need a partner to help me get there. But I believe this is what God has for me in my life. The diary of a little girl lost for 20, I'm almost 40 for 20 years, and now I'm stuck. At that point, I actually felt like I a little bit lost my free will. What am I gonna do with that? Meaning they had all of the reasons not to go and do it. Are we not gonna follow our dreams? Well, seemingly being guided before we were even knew each other. I mean, that's too much to deal with. So we were kind of struggling with this for a while, and eventually we said, we only live once. It's too, I, I, it will be the biggest regret of our lives if we just stay here in our comfort zone and always live with what if we would have followed our dreams? What if we were being guided to do something really marvelous for Israel and the Jewish people? Let's just sell our home and just do it. And my wife is like, all right. Every day we say, Ve'ahavta et Hashem Elohecha, bechol levavcha, uvechol nafshecha, uvechol meodecha. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all of your soul, and all of your... So might... But me'odecha doesn't mean might. Koach is might. What does me'od mean? Very. Well, that's a peculiar word. To love God with all of your very. Well, that's weird. So I started investigating. What does that mean? There are so many interpretations. I love the Jewish world. There's like 3,000 years of debates on what that word means. With all of your time, with all of your money, with all of your family, with all of your might, with all of your power, with all of your mind. I mean, there's just, it's, it means with all of your very. So that just leaves it open for any interpretation you really want. And I feel like there were 3,000 years of interpretations of what that means. And I sort of felt like at that moment that they're all right. Like actually try to live your life with everything you got. How many times do we get to actually do that? So Jews that make Aliyah, they get to do that. They pick up their life, their family, their job, and they're like, that's it, we're making Aliyah to Israel. I didn't get to do that. My, my family brought me when I was a little boy. I'm like, this is my chance. This is my Aliyah moment to walk out into the unknown, to follow what I think is the right thing for me to do and for what's right for Israel and the Jewish people. I'm in, let's do it. And then we sold our home. We burned our bridges and we put, I mean, as my life savings, onto this mountaintop. And as soon as I did that, all hell broke loose. All hell broke loose. We had a woman that came to the farm that committed to giving us $800,000 to help complete the visitor center. She gave us $200,000, another $200,000, another $200,000, and we signed a contract with a contractor for $800,000. At the $600,000 mark, 
the Swiss government, because she's a Jewish woman from Switzerland, taxed her 100% for every dollar she gave to Israel. So a $800,000 commitment became $600,000 given to Israel, a $1.2 million expense. And she's not a rich lady. She didn't have $1.2 million. And she's like, listen, until we figure this thing out, I can't make the last payment. And I'm like, uh oh, we signed a contract for 800,000. This is gonna get ugly. And so eventually the contractor saw what was up and it was time to make the next payment. And we're like, listen, Mr. Contractor, I'm sorry, but we don't exactly have the funds right now. And he's like, well, if you don't pay me, I'm not gonna build your house. I'm like, what, not build my house? Wait, no, no, no. I have enough money for my own staff house on this property, but let's just separate the things. I mean, I have six kids. He's like, I'm sorry, if I don't get paid, I have workers to pay, I've bought materials, I want my payment, and if you don't pay me, I'm not building your house. And I'm like, oh, okay. So for a month, Tehillah and I were traveling around Israel with six kids, a week in Ashkelon, a week in Tveria, a week in Jerusalem, just wandering because we had nowhere to go because our house was wasn't being built. At the same time, three left-wing organizations. I do this left-wing thing because I don't know what makes them left-wing. I don't know what does left-wing mean. There were always Jews amongst us that were enemies of the Jewish people that um, ratted us to the Catholics, ratted us to the communists. They worked alongside the Nazis. So there are these other organizations that are receiving $5 million a year from three European governments. And their job is to sue places in Judea and Samaria to destroy anything that's being built there. At that time, 18 homes were just destroyed in a community next to me called El Azar in a neighborhood called Nativ Ha'avot. The same three organizations finished destroying those homes and they said, oh my goodness, this farm is actually getting built. They are the next, in all of their resources now, they attacked our farm. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I don't have a home. I'm in 700,000 shekels of debt and I'm being sued now to destroy everything that I've built. What have I done? I'm, I'm following my dreams? I'm, what am I, an insane man? What is wrong with me? I have six children. This is so irresponsible. What have I done? And so I'm trying to like navigate through a lot of chaos now. And as I'm like trying to like work through this, I'm like, these three European countries, Germany, Denmark, and Norway, it's not warfare, it's lawfare. Now it's me and my six kids are up against three countries in Judea and Samaria, going like that, guarding our land, our homeland. And I was like, not fair. They have more money, they have more power, and here they are suing this little Israeli family that's just trying to do the right thing. And at the same time, they're calling me a colonizing settler. Imagine that. Why are Jews called Jews? So usually I bring this up with every group that comes to Judea and comes to our farm, and groups from all over the world come. And I, this is an important note. So usually there's a relatively knowledgeable Christian in the group. They'll be like, oh, you're from the tribe of Judah. And I'm like, well, that's not true. The first person in the Bible to be called a Jew is Mordechai. Mordechai, ha Yehudi, right? It's in the book of Esther. And then the Pasuk continues, Ish Yemini, from the tribe of Benjamin. Well, if he's from the tribe of Benjamin, why is he called a Jew? Why is he called a Yehudi if he's from the tribe of Benjamin? Well, here's the real answer. Jews are called Jews not because of the tribe of Judah, but Jews are from Judea. Japanese are from Japan. Chinese are from China. Hungarians are from Hungary. Jews, we're from Judea. Now imagine that. It sounds almost logical. West Bank occupying settlers evacuate this political territory. Okay, maybe that sounds legitimate. But really, what they're saying is, Jews, get out of Judea. And that's just a little bit harder for the ear to hear. So they have to, like, make up new... I mean, every map in history. I live in the mountains of Judea, the Judean desert. Only recently, the area's been called the West Bank. West of what? What is it west of? It's west of Jordan. Jordan has no claim on the land. It's an illogical name. Jordan's not asking for the land, but every time CNN talks about Judea and Samaria, they will call it the West Bank. Now imagine this. Three European countries are calling me a colonizing settler. While they're meddling in my country's business for their political agendas, they're calling me a colonizer. While they're literally trying to colonize Israel. The chutzpah and the irony. Just like a little bit of truth. And so here I am just like struggling and struggling. Just like, I mean, you saw, I put money aside to buy a car. 
I'm in 700,000 shekels of debt. I'm being sued in the Supreme Court of Israel. I, my house isn't being completed. Eventually the contractor's like, I want my payment or I'm taking you to court. And I'm like, I, we just, as soon as money comes in, Abu Shadi, we are gonna pay you. He's like, well, you have sheep. We had 70 sheep, a flock of sheep. I was like, you can pay in sheep? I just didn't, I was like in Neve Daniel and in Boston, you don't pay with sheep. In Hebron, you can still pay in sheep. So we had 70 sheep. He took 60 of our sheep. Today we have 18 sheep. It's like they, they make babies, you know? So even if 10, eventually we'll grow it back. And so that bought us another 10 days until our next payment. And I'm like, what are we going to do now? What are we going to do? I mean, this was a, I mean, because, I mean, is it all a coincidence? The dreams, the notebook, God, well, what, what's going on here? So right as we're to the very wire, all of a sudden my partner, Arya Bramowitz, gets an email from a woman in Hong Kong. Could you imagine a place more distant geographically, culturally than China? Hong Kong. I feel as though God is telling me to help you build up the land of Israel. Please send me your wiring information. And now six or seven years earlier, this person who I had never met before, I've never met her before, she gave us $5,000 to support our TV show that we were creating at that time. And she gave us $5,000. I'm like, listen, $5,000. Every dollar helps right now. Great. Send her the wiring information. Three days later, I go check our bank account. And she wired us $250,000. Brought us entirely out of debt and then pushed us forward. I never met this woman before. I didn't ask her for any money. And out of nowhere, a woman from China in Hong Kong felt called by God to send us money to help us on our mission. Then the state responded to the three left-wing organizations that sued us to destroy our farm. And the state responded saying, this was done in coordination with the municipality, in coordination with the Ministry of Tourism. There's not even a re to destroy everything. There's not even a reason to give us a warrant to stop the construction. <coughs> They're doing everything right. This is state zoned land for agriculture and tourism, and they are building a farm that will be a tourist attraction in Israel. They're totally kosher. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, all of the fears and all of the chaos, it was just like a boogeyman. They just all disappeared. And I'm like, oh, we made it on the mountain. Now the first month in my house was a little bit challenging because I'm dealing with all of the chaos of these things hovering over me and we didn't have a toilet. Do you guys know what a compost toilet is? We had a compost toilet outside the house. Now imagine six kids trying to get them to school with a compost toilet outside your house with Arab workers on your roof finishing off your house. So my wife would put on her head covering in the morning be like, hi, Ahmad. All right, I'm on the toilet. Okay, off the toilet. No, I'm on the toilet. Six kids on a compost toilet outside. And the whole time you should know my wife, it's just recorded. I'm in my room at nighttime for about three months. Literally, it's, it's unpleasant because I'm a warrior of Israel and the IDF. I'm crying in bed, crying, being like, what? have I done? What have I done? My wife, the entire time, not even one time did she complain. The whole time, she's like, this is the adventure of a lifetime. We're never going to regret this. Compost toilets, they're so ecological. We should have compost toilets in our house. I mean, she's just like unbelievable. And so I, here I am just like trying to put one foot in front of the other. And my wife never broke even for a moment. And so here we are now, slowly but surely, trying to like, you know, better this place. And as I start getting more and more acquainted with this area in Judea, so I realize like, there's something about it that just touches the Jewish people really deep inside. I mean, it's not that the land belongs to me, it's that we belong to that land. That land gave us our identity as who we are. And I started learning more and more about the geography and the maps of this place. And those mountains in Judea are specifically called the mountains of Ziph. And it's where King David ran to before he became king, when he was hiding from Saul. It says he ran to the mountains and wilderness of Ziph. And here I am standing in the mountains of Ziph and I'm looking at all these caves that are all around us. And I'm like, in these caves, David and his men lived for years. And those men, those were his most loyal commando elite Delta Force soldiers for the rest of his life. In some ways, the kingdom of Israel, the armies of Israel were established in those mountains. And then I'm continuing to like learn more and more about King David and Judea and the history. 
Most of the book of Tehillim, according to the Midrash, was written in those mountains before David became king. And I'm like, wow, that's, I mean, I, I came there to pray my morning prayers, and here I am now reading the book of Psalms that are in, you know, Psuche de Zimra. And I'm like, this is, was written here in this mountain. You know, and we have so many groups come to our farm now. I mean, from every, I mean, now it's from Africa, Hungary, Holland, Japan, Korea, America, Chilonim from Tel Aviv, Haredim from Lakewood. I mean, just every, it's everyone. And everyone comes and they're touched in a different way. But there's something about King David. There's something about Judea. There's something about it. But imagine the book of Psalms, if you're a Catholic in Brazil, a Protestant in Germany, or a Jew in Boston. When someone is sick, we open up the book of Tehillim. It's like King David taught the whole world how to pray. And those prayers came into the world in those mountains. Until we paved the road over three mountaintops, those mountains were inaccessible to people. And all of a sudden, we've opened up the mountains of the book of Tehillim to the whole world. We had a dream that the place would be a place of meditation, of prayer, of music, of art, that there would almost, we would innovate a new concept in Israel called spiritual tourism. That, you know, if people want to go to the beach in Eilat and Tel Aviv, fine. But someone that wants to go on a pilgrimage, a spiritual encounter, Israel ha is the most spiritual country in the world and spiritual tourism isn't really developed. And now this would be an amazing opportunity because we're, so, we're only 25 minutes outside of Jerusalem, but once you're there, I wanted so much just to show you some videos and drone footage. There's, you're in the middle of the mountains, in the middle of nature, underneath the stars. It's just, it's gorgeous. Like I can try to explain, and even the videos, it's like showing you a, a sheet of music, and then one is like going to the Philharmonic Orchestra. It's like nothing that I can say can ever really do it. I mean, look, Yonina came one time and she's like, everyone in Boston needs to know about this. And she wanted to bring everyone together just so they could experience and hear what she saw. And there's something marvelous in the fact that it's so politically sensitive only heightens the experience that somehow it's like on the cutting edge of Jewish history right now. And you know, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, and I never really liked rap music. That was the well, I like rap music. And then at one point, one of these people said, do you know what rap means? And I'm like, oh, rap means something. They're like, it's an acronym for rhythm and poetry. I'm like, oh, I never knew that. King David was the first human rapper. <laughs> He's the first man in human history to put rhythm to poetry, to put music to words. He invented that concept of rhythm and poetry. And here we are, um, we wanted to create a center of music and prayer and meditation but already encoded in the stones itself. This place was destined to be a place of prayer and music long before we were born. It's almost like we're unveiling and revealing what was already there, but now we're just uncovering it in 2019. I get a little bit shell-shocked when I come to the United States, especially after so long for not being here. And when I was in Ben Gurion Airport, I had like this thought. You know, when you go past passport control, there's a moving sidewalk that goes down to the big area where you wait for your planes to go. And on the side of the moving sidewalk are uh, pictures. The last time that I was there, it had all the Nobel Prizes and in innovations that Israel has done. The drip irrigation technology and biochemistry and clean tech and high tech and all these amazing things that have changed the world that have come out of Israel. And I had this moment where I was like, I, you know, my grandfather who walked to Israel, so his name was Mordechai. The last person we know on my family tree is my grandfather's grandfather. And his name was Zev. We don't know almost anything about him except his name. And I was like, imagine if I would bring Zev, my grandfather's grandfather, to Ben Gurion Airport. What would he think? So he'd go through passport control. And I'm just kind of like dreaming this up as I'm doing it. We're walking down the moving, hey, you go on a moving sidewalk. That would already be revolution, a moving sidewalk. That would be amazing. And then he sees that he's in Israel and there's Ben Gurion Airport and all of the innovations and technologies and scientific discoveries are on the side of the wall that have like blessed Africa and changed the world of science. And there's pills that you swallow. They're able to detect through cameras. And I mean, just like the technologies are endless. And then he's hearing everyone's talking Hebrew. 
And in Bialystok, no one spoke Hebrew. They spoke Yiddish, maybe Russian, maybe Poland, depending on what time of year. But no one spoke Hebrew. Everyone's talking Hebrew. And there's big, tall, blonde Jews from Russia. And there's brown Jews from Morocco. And there's black Jews from Ethiopia. And there's American Jews. And everyone's all together. And he's like, what if this is like? I, he would just be astounded. And then at one point, he would see an IDF soldier. And he, I'm sure he would be nervous because anytime a Jew saw a soldier in Paul, that was not good news for the Jews. But then as he would turn, he would see that there's two blue stripes and a Magen David on his shoulder. Yeah. I think my, my grandfather's grandfather would plot. <laughs> I think that he would plot. I think he'd be like, what? This is it? This is? And sometimes when I'm at the farm, I have like a gift where I'm planting a tree. It's hard to explain, but it... It feels like I'm, 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 my hands are reaching out through time. And I'm planting the tree on behalf of all of the people before me. But my hands are just the ones doing it. But if we really think about that, the Jewish people have been praying for thousands of years to return to Judea and make the desert blossom like the prophets promised it would. It's hard to exist when you are the answer our lives in Israel are the answer of thousands of years of prayer. Their prayers are literally answered through our lives. Because, you know, here in America, I immediately get lost. I feel like, wow, there's, there's so many people in America, and there's so many nationalities, and there's so many sports teams, and it just feels very, like, wobbly. It feels like very fle like floating through infinity here. There's so many opportunities and identities, and there's... All of a sudden, though, in Israel, it's like, oh, I'm an extension of a 4,000-year-old people rooted in a land where all of a sudden my soul feels fully expressed. It's like before, and it's, I mean, I grew up in Judea. I went to high school in Ephrat, but somehow as soon as I went to the frontier and I left like all of the, 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 the traffic circles and the lights and the houses and I was just in nature, it felt like... Growing up in Atlanta, like my mom always was, the assimilation rate, it's, it's a silent holocaust. The Jews are intermarrying. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? There's, do we have to bring excitement back to the Jewish people? And I was like, well, it's like a fish out of water. And it's like fl flopping on the riverbank, gasping for air and slowly dying. And a fish only has like a two-minute memory span. After a minute, that's what the fish is at that point. It already forgot what it was. And now it's just, this is what it is to be a fish, flopping on the this riverbank, gasping for air, and slowly dying. That's what a life of a fish is. And all of a sudden, I was put into the mountains of Judea. And I'm like, I'm at, it's like back, it's like a fish in a Like, oh, this is what it is to be a Jew. Oh, wow. This is what it is to be a Jew. This is amazing. It was like a, a discovering that I'm a part of, I'm the answer to the prayer. I don't know, how to, it's hard to explain, but I'm telling you, if as soon as you come, something happens there. It's like you wake up, your heart is touched, your soul is aroused. The views are so breathtaking, but it's not just the natural beauty of the place. It's all of it put together in one like experience. And what's so crazy is that that's, potentially on the chopping block to be given away? The one place where a Jew can actually be a Jew in the world. If we don't have a right to Judea, do we really have a right to Tel Aviv? Do we really have a right to Haifa? I mean, if we're able to convince ourselves or the world is able to convince us that Jews don't belong in Judea, where does a Jew belong? Not in Boston, just being honest. We are a minority in this land. Christmas comes around and we're all a little bit like, this is not exactly our home. In Israel, we're celebrating Hanukkah. Yom Kippur is a national holiday where everyone has off from work. There's a place where we can just be us. Now that might not be the right place for everyone at this stage in their life, but to take Judea away from the Jews, over my dead body. No way. Absolutely not. And what is the fight now then? It's so simple. It's just to make this place normal. Right now, he's like, well, it's so dangerous there. 
I've been there for four years in the deepest settlement in Judea. I've never once had a rock thrown at me. I've never once experienced anything other than absolute pleasure and serenity. In fact, when I'm there, I feel like I'm in the safest place in the world. In the mountains, there's no one even around me. There's no Arabs, there's no Jews. I honestly don't even know if I could only show you the pictures. Who do they want to give it to? There's literally no one there. I can show you the pictures on my phone. As far as the eye can see all the way to the Dead Sea, there's no Jewish settlements. There's no Arab cities. It's just open, natural space. What is the mission of this generation then? I think that's really the, what is the calling of this generation? One time it was maybe to return to the land. One time it was to fight off the Nazis. One was to fight off the British. What is the land? What is the mission now? To me, it's like when I analyze the situation right now, the whole world right now is dependent on the success of Israel. If Israel fails, the whole world is going to be plunged into chaos. We are literally the front lines. The whole world. That's why if I build an extension onto my home, International headlines. 3,000 Kurds were killed last week by Turkey. No one cares. It's not about the championing of the Palestinian cause and the occupation. I employ 40 Arab families as we've been building this farm. I've brought prosperity to a place where there was nothing. I've brought law and order because now that more tourists are coming and more jobs are there, the police patrol the roads now. So instead of insane drivers, they're still Israeli drivers, so they're bad, but it used to be lawless. Now there's law and order. There's prosperity. Imagine that every place that Israel goes, there's law and order, peace and prosperity. So they want to make the one place that's free, where there's order. The one, I mean, every country around us is descending into chaos. They want to take the land away from the one stable country and get, send it into chaos again? Governor Mike Huckabee was out at our farm about two months ago. He brought 25 congressional candidates. And he doesn't get paid for that. He does it literally because he believes in the Jewish rights to the land of Israel. And he wants the people that are going into Congress to just know the facts on the ground. Let them see who we're occupying and what the Jews are doing in Judea. Let them just hear from the people like me about our rights to the land and why we're there. And it was a marvelous time. But I went to Governor Huckabee and I said, well, the next time, you know, because his daughter was the spokesman of the White House. I was like, well, the next time, if you have a chance, I have a peace plan. I would love you to introduce to President Trump. It's a land for peace plan. And he's like, a land for peace plan? But... I mean, aren't you a settler in, in Judea? Land? I'm like, here's my idea. All of the countries <clears throat> around Israel, Lebanon, Syria, the Kurds, ISIS, Jordan, they're all, they're, there's, there's no prosperity, no economy, no order. There's not even dictatorships. To, it's just absolute chaos. They should give Israel their land and we will bring peace and prosperity, law and order to an orderless place. And then I saw like a light go off. I was like, I was like, Governor, you see the best, the best defense is a good offense. They want to take away my land. I'm going for their land now. And I said, and the border should be until the Euphrates. You know, because he's a pastor before he was a governor. So he liked that. But I think that that's, you know, Israel is the only chance that the Middle East and ultimately the world has. And so that's really a big responsibility to be a light to the nations in the darkest region in the world. So if we think that really like the future of the world is resting on Israel's shoulders, then when we look inside Israel, what's the linchpin? What is the mission of this generation? My friends, it's Judea and Samaria. That's what's on the chopping block right now. All efforts need to be in strengthening the weakest place. It's also our homeland. It's where we come from. Without Judea, what are we? We're just a religion? Is that really what we are? And then what kind of religion? Are we reform? Are we conservative? Are we orthodox? People say that I'm orthodox, and I just abhor that word. It sounds like I'm a shoe doctor. In Israel, no one says the word orthodox. Orthodox? Who is our marketing guy here? <laughs> orthodox? So what's that? So, but Judaism is not a religion. In Israel, you know that. In Israel, you feel that. We're a family. In Israel, we're a nation, we're a country, we're a people with a destiny. Yes, we have a Torah that we live by. We have a moral guide. We have a way that we live. But it's not a religion. I mean, we had to kind of keep it as a religion for 2,000 years. We had to like pack up our national identity into a religion so we could maintain those values. 
But now that we've returned to the land of Israel, Judaism is so much more holistic than just a religion. It's not just another part of my identity. I'm an Atlanta Braves fan, and I'm a Republican, and I'm a Democrat, and I'm a Jew, and I'm a this, and I'm Jewish. It's, it's, it, is, it is the way of life there. It is just, it is all encompassing. The kids go to public schools, but the public schools are teaching parashat shavua, meaning like, you know, it's, just, it's a part of this, the reality of what it is to be a Jew. And right now, the weakest place in Israel is Judea and Samaria. And so, what do you need to do? When you come to Israel next, come to Judea and Samaria. I feel like every single person, Jew or non-Jew, that comes to our mountain, it's a mitzvah. It's a mitzvah. We're normalizing the most unstable place in Israel. We're making prosperous. We're bringing jobs. We're bringing tourism. That is the mission. The more normal it becomes, the more it becomes ours. Not only for us. I honestly don't understand. I spend most of my days now with many Arab workers. I know their families. I'm with them. If they were to be locked behind a fence and just thrown into chaos under some dictatorship of this Palestinian authority or this Hamas government, their lives would be miserable. I don't understand like the liberal human rights people that even want such a thing. They have the best lives, better than any Arab anywhere in the Middle East currently right now. Even under the, the scenario of what it is now, they have a better life than any Arab in the Middle East. And they want to descend it into chaos. On the contrary, we need to continue to build. We're already building field hospitals in Syria. It's already happening. Syria can't take care of itself. So Israel, with our tax money, is going into Syria and building field hospitals there. Soon we need to start building schools there. And we need to help rehabilitate the region that is so dark. That's affecting the whole world. But first and foremost, in our homeland, in Judea and Samaria. And so I've come here, you know, all, of, all, all around the world um, to invite you to come and visit the Arugot farm. That's why I'm here. Uh, it'll be the highlight of your trip. And just to like put things, <clears throat> to break us out of just the religion of Judaism for a second. About a one hour hike from our farm, they discovered letters signed by Bar Kokhba. In our cave, on our property, half of the walls of the cave are black. And it's like, doesn't fit the white stones of the area. So we brought an archaeologist there and we're like, what is this black on the cave? He's like, oh, that's 2,000 year old fire from the rebellion of Bar Kokhba and Rabbi Akiva. They were right here in this cave. This is their fire. So marvelous. About 1,830 years ago, Bar Kokhba sends out this message in a letter. And it was frozen in time. For almost 2,000 years. Do you know who discovered the letters? Of the last Jewish general of the last Jewish army in the land of Israel. It was a man named Yigael Yadin, who was the first general of the new Jewish army in the land of Israel. From general to general, almost like on special delivery. And the message is just right there. The story continues with us. We are the next chapter in these caves. King David spent time in those caves. The Maccabees escaped to the mountains of Zif. Bar Kokhba was there. And here we are, 2019. The Jewish people are still fighting for our freedom in Judea once again. And we have a chance to be a small part of our history. What we build in Israel is attaching ourselves to the everlasting, eternal story of Israel. See, in Israel, in, outside of Israel, I remember growing up, my parents wanted me so much to be an observant Jew. Um, so that was like the ideal. And the more I think about that language, to be an observing Jew, I'm observing. I'm watching history unfold before my eyes, and I'm observing it from the sidelines. The other option is to get the ball and run down the field. To not see ourselves as observers of a religion on the sidelines watching it happen. But to take our place within Jewish history. To take the ball and run down the field and push the story forward as players in the game. The story continues with us. And now this is the greatest chapter of the story. This last week at our farm, from Sunday until Shabbat, 
On Wednesday, they're leaving. We had 12 German volunteers come to our farm. These Germans are the children and grandchildren of Nazis. They spent seven days while I was there building a 200 meter pergola right outside the largest ecological pool in, in Israel, which is on our farm. Because we're making it into a Garden of Eden-like oasis at the edge of the desert, and the ecological pool is gorgeous. But there was no shade. We're in the middle of the desert. So they built us a beautiful, amazing 200 square meter pergola that now there's shade in the desert next to the most beautiful pool. And for day after day, they would wake up and work. And when they say they're going to be up at 6.30, I'm still like on Jewish time at 6.37. I give them a call. We are waiting for you, waiting to work. And I'm like, oh my gosh, Germans. <laughs> and here I am watching these Germans on their hands and knees, laying down concrete. And I'm thinking to myself, if only the Jewish people 75 years ago could see that the children and grandchildren of their worst enemy are now serving the Jewish people, volunteering, helping us build up Judea. What's going on? We are living in the most marvelous times. In Israel, you know, we have it in us, the Jewish people. We want to change the world. We want to. Look at all of the organizations. Greenpeace, the NWACP. They're all they're Jews. There are Jews everywhere. Helping change the world. Saving the whales. Saving the this. As a Jew, maybe you can save six whales. At best, seven. If you really want to fix the whole world, we need a country. And that's why tikkun olam is just the first part of that statement. It says, Tikkun Olam Bemalchut Shaddai, in the kingdom of God. We're going to need a kingdom, a country, to really change things. And so here we are now, continuing this amazing story of the nation of Israel, the greatest comeback story in all times. From the ashes and the dry bones that Echeskel saw, the state of Israel was resurrected. And now we're the strongest military in the Middle East, the strongest economy by far in the Middle East. The, the shekel is one of the strongest currencies in the world. From what? From how? When my grandfather first came to Israel, there were 60,000 Jews in the land. Today, we're scratching 7 million. There's never been a country in the history of the world that has had a population explosion from 60,000 to over 6 million in 100 years. That's never happened before. And the Hebrew language... I mean, yes, in the book of Zephania, in the third chapter, it says the Hebrew language will be revived and ultimately be an international language. Well, look at that. I asked my dad, I was like, Abba, how did that happen? That happened in his generation. Abba, how did that happen that all of a sudden everyone started speaking Hebrew? And he's like, oh, that's a great question, you know. Well, your grandfather had to speak to me in a language that he didn't really know, in a language that didn't really exist, and trust that everyone in the country would do the same irrational thing at the same time. And everyone in the country did the same irrational thing at the same time. And in one generation, the Hebrew language was resurrected from the dead. Now we have an opportunity to play our small part in history. Because we're all just individuals. We're all only going to play a small part. But better to play a small part than to play no part at all. And right now, the tip of the spear is Judea and Samaria. And it happens to be that the Arugot farm is the deepest settlement in Judea, in Gush Etzion today. And so I've come here to try to share a little bit of the beauty, of the magic of this place. The story of my own personal journey is just like another like sign of something miraculous that's happening there, guided literally by divine providence. There's no other way to explain it because it was a desert, barren land with not a single tree. Today, there's over 4,000 fruit trees, three vineyards, a flock of sheep, a horse named Hector, chickens, children. I just, from what? There was no water, there was no electricity. And so, everyone comes to Israel every once in a while. And so, I'm here to say that on your next trip, to please come out to the Arugot farm and just experience the Judean frontier. And uh, to be a Jew in Judea, and to just breathe the air there for a while. It is to be the answer of our Father's prayers that we would be able to go back to our birthplace. And now the roads are paved. 
that it's open to the public. I invite you to join us because it's like no other place in Israel. All right, thank you all tonight. Hanukkah Sameach to all of our listeners. Let's keep our lights shining bright. Happy Hanukkah from the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. Hi, this is Gil Hoffman, host of Inside Israel Today. Happy Hanukkah from Jerusalem. So let's be together. Let's light it up.